In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're talking about Joseph today, and hopefully you know the story. Um, it's familiar to you. If it's not, I'm sorry. You may need to read through it later today. It starts in Genesis 37. But if you're familiar with the story, we're going to move forward. It, Joseph was 17 when Genesis 37 happens. He's the favored son of his father. His father gave him Armani, an Armani suit when everyone else wore, Imar, or, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm thinking of decathlon clothing. Thank you. My mind was in South Korea, and I was thinking of Korean stores. But uh, basically, Joseph got the Armani suit or the Gucci suit, and his brothers got decathlon warm-up jackets. Um, and so his brothers hated him. They absolutely hated him. They couldn't speak a nice word. And, and not only was Joseph favored, uh, he, he tattled on his brothers. He brought a bad report to the father. And so all the brothers hate him. And then he has a dream. And the dream is they're working in the field. And his sheave stands up in front of his brothers. And his brothers, all the, sheave, the bundles of wheat all bow down. Uh, and so in, in that culture, dreams were important and meaningful as a way that God spoke. Remember, they didn't have a written word of God. So God spoke through dreams. And so the bowing down is symbolic, and it drives his brothers crazy because he's the youngest, and yet he's saying, I'm going to rule. He gets the dream again, but this time the, uh, the sun, the moon are, are bowing down too, symbolizing his parents. And again, it, it just drives his brother crazy, or his brothers. Have you ever been driven crazy by a younger brother? Anybody? A few? A few of us, you can relate to this text. Maybe you are the youngest and you've, you've driven your older siblings crazy. Anyway, they hate him. Now, Joseph is arrogant. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the favored one. But their response is over the top. They decide they're going to kill him. They see Joseph coming later in the story. And they say, let's kill him and see what happens to his dreams. Instead of killing them, they sell him into slavery. Can you imagine being the favored son, having your brothers sell you as a slave, and you're taken to a foreign land? I mean, I mean put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a minute. You, you know, OK, you're a little cocky. You're a little arrogant. But sell me into slavery? How betrayed would you feel? Your whole family, all your siblings sell, I mean, they hate you so much, they sell you as a slave. How, how bitter would you be in your heart? Have you ever been forced out? Have you ever been forced out of a job by someone or a group of people who don't like you? Have you ever been forced out of a social circle? Have you ever been forced out of a family gathering because people don't like you, because they're jealous of you, because you did something that made them angry and so they force you out? I'm not seeing any nodding heads, but can anybody relate to being forced out? You know, when you get forced out of something, when, when it's so clear that people hate you, What's a natural response? I'm, I'm, you hate them back? Yeah, that's natural. What else? You feel sorry for yourself? Self-pity? Hatred? What else? Revenge? Anger? Bitterness? Right? So a natural response to anger or to being betrayed, to being forced out, hatred, bitterness, anger, revenge, self-pity. Why? What did I do to deserve this? This is a natural way for us to respond. Now, what, is, what does Jesus teach us about bitterness and anger and revenge? It's pretty, you know, 
What does he teach us? If you could sum it up in one word, what would it be? Sin, right? It's sin. Bitterness and anger, revenge, it's sin. Now, the Bible tells us that sin is, that the sins of the wicked are like cords that bind them. So the evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sin hold them fast. So, June, can you help me out again? So, I've got, actually, we'll, we'll come over here. I've got this cord. And if I can wrap it. So, let's say June is betrayed like Joseph. He's forced out. He's mistreated. He's hated. And so, he just starts wrapping himself up in bitterness and anger. And have you done this? Have you ever wrapped yourself up in bitterness? It's just, it's what you think about when you wake up in the morning. It's what you get, you're waiting for coffee at Starbucks, and then you remember what they did to you, and you, you're angry. <laughs> Am I the only one? No, we, we can relate to this. But what, what we know is that this type of anger and bitterness is sin. It's sin. And what the Bible tells us is that sin and bitterness are that sin, the sin of, of the wicked holds them fast. And so Joseph could have gone to Egypt as a slave bound in chains, but also bound in bitterness. Not just, not just a physical slave, but an emotional slave. You're bound, you're held fast, you're snared. Now, if he's bound emotionally with bitterness and anger, how, does, how is he gonna live his life what, what is, what's the way he's going to live his life? His life will be, what? I mean, when you're angry and you're bitter and you want revenge, how do you treat other people? It, it bleeds into everything, doesn't it? I mean, because he's not like, oh, you know, June is not like, oh, I hate Peter. But Cordero, I love you. I'm going to be a great friend to you, but I, I hate Samuel. It, it bleeds into everything. It impacts everything. And that's why the Bible says it's like a cord that holds you fast. It, it's, it's, you can't compartmentalize bitterness, anger, and sin. So Joseph could have gone to Egypt bound as a slave, but also as an emotional slave to sin. But he didn't, did he? Oh, thank you, June. We'll release you from your bitterness and anger. <laughs> Thank you, June. Oh, you can leave it there. Joseph didn't go bound, because what, what do we know? The very next thing about Joseph, we find out he's a slave of Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. And in chapter 39, it tells us this, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master and his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed, all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So Joseph is a slave, betrayed by his brothers, ends up in Potiphar's house. But instead of retreating, instead of being bound with bitterness and anger and the desire for revenge, instead, Joseph puts his gloves on. I'm using a lot of props today. Hopefully, it'll help you remember. Joseph puts his gloves on. What do I mean? He, he gets to work. He, he's unfairly sold into slavery. He's in a place he doesn't deserve to be in. His family hates him. But instead of being bound with bitterness and anger and waking up every day saying, I hate my brother. I can't believe they did this. Someday I'm going to get back at them. Joseph puts his gloves on and he gets to work. He's in a situation that he cannot control. It's unjust. He's been mistreated. And yet he doesn't run away from God. He doesn't take out his anger. 
He doesn't say, well, forget this. I'm just going to do enough to get by. I'm going to wait for God to change my situation. You see, Joseph had these dreams, two dreams from God. And those dreams were someday he was going to be a leader. He knew in his heart that I was not created to be a slave. I'm, I'm created to be a leader. God has a plan for me. But when we are treated unjustly, unfairly, when we're betrayed, one of our responses can be, well, I'm just going to wait for God to change this situation. If you're going to treat me this way, I'll, I'll do the minimum. I'll show up. I'll do what I need to do. But God, when are you going to fix this? Have you, have you ever done that? You're just, you, know, you know you're in a place that you're not meant for, but there you are. And you just wait passively for God to fix it. See, Joseph didn't do that. Because if he was just waiting passively, he wouldn't have been promoted. If he was just waiting passively for God to take him out of slavery, he wouldn't have succeeded in what he was doing because he would not have tried. He put his gloves on. He went to work. He could not control where he was. He could not control what people were doing to him. The one thing he could control was his attitude and his effort and his heart toward God. That's what he had control of. Whatever situation you're in, however you've been betrayed, however you've been mistreated, whatever circumstances you're stuck in, you still have control of your attitude, your effort toward God. And what we see in Joseph is that instead of feeling sorry for himself, instead of plotting for re revenge, he puts his gloves on. And maybe you're at work and you got kicked out of something. And you're saying it's not fair. I shouldn't have been treated this way. What does it mean to put your gloves on? For Joseph, it looked like something needs to be organized. I'll organize it. Something needs to be fixed. I'll fix it. Something needs to happen here. I'll do it. And what happened is he started fixing things and organizing things and working in a way that his boss recognized that God was with him. You know, sometimes we think that God is just going to promote us you know, like, OK, I'm in slavery now. You know, I'm in this job now. I'm in this difficult situation now. I just need to wait on the Lord. But if, if there's someone who shows in your workplace who shows up to work and they are just angry and want revenge and they're just waiting for their life to change. Are, are those the types of people who get pegged for promotion? Jansen, is that the kind of person you would promote? No, you wouldn't. You're like, let me reduce their responsibility. Let me shift them to another place. But why would we think spiritually that God would promote us if spiritually we're just waiting and watching Netflix? Do you, do you see what I mean? When, when we get into pain, when we're mistreated and we're betrayed or people force us out, or we're going to see in a moment falsely accuse us, we can react by getting upset with the world and saying, well, I'm just going to watch something or medicate myself through sports or whatever and wait for God to change my situation. I'm just waiting on the Lord. But God shows us through Joseph that the way to get out is not by watching Netflix, it's by putting your gloves on. And saying, I'm in this situation, and I'm going to do what I can where I am. This is a godly response, even though he's faced so much injustice. And it doesn't stop, right? Because the next thing that happens is he gets falsely accused. I mean, you know, Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him and, and accuses him of attempted assault. So he gets thrown into prison. How much worse can it get? First, he's betrayed by his family, and he does his absolute best. And while he's honoring God and walking in integrity and holding on to his faith, someone falsely accuses him of sexual assault. And he gets thrown into prison. Now, when you're in prison, when you're falsely accused, again, what's the temptation? 
the temptation is bitterness and anger and revenge. And once I get out of here, I'm going to get her. But if you hold on to bitterness and revenge and you wake up in the morning thinking, man, I hate this person. I can't believe they did to me. It actually binds you. And if I'm bound, I can't receive from God. Because why? Because first God has to set me free from my chains. So he can't move me forward because I'm bound in bitterness and anger. You're getting me, right? Joseph, what we know is he did not hold on to bitterness and anger. Because when he went into prison, what did he do? He didn't just put his, his gloves on. He's in a different situation. He started serving. Yes. He started serving. How did he serve? What we know is that it says the prison warden put him in charge. Whatever there was done to be done, Joseph was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So Joseph, again, he ends up in prison, but he doesn't get angry. He doesn't seek revenge. He's just like, okay, I'm in this situation now. I'm more restricted, but what can I do? And so he serves, even in prison. I don't know how much serving you can do in prison, but it probably has to do with cleaning. It probably has to do with food and serving people food and cleaning things. This is menial tasks, dirty tasks. This used to be the guy wearing the Armani suit. But here he is. He can't control when he gets out of prison. He can't control what people do and say about him. The one thing he can tr control is his attitude, his effort, and his heart toward God. That, that's what he can control. And he decides, I'm, I believe God. I'm going to stay with God. And, and we know this. I, you know, we, we see it in the text, and I'll read it in a second. But one of the things we see is that if you are bound in bitterness, how do you relate to other people? Are you able to serve other people? When you see someone, you just you need something from them. If I'm bound in bitterness and angry, when I see Cordero, I'm not thinking, Cordero, how can I serve you? I'm thinking, Cordero, how can you give me what I need? And maybe it's sympathy. I'm going to tell him my story. And he's going to be like, man, those jerks. I can't believe she did that to you. Or I need something from him. But if I come like this, it's, it's very different. And what we see is Joseph, it says that the Pharaoh's two servants, the chief baker and the wine taster, were in custody and Joseph came to them in the morning, and he saw they were troubled. He said, why are your faces downcast today? What does that tell you about Joseph? Joseph is serving. He's aware of other people's emotional state. He knows what they looked like yesterday, and he knows what they look like today, and he's getting involved. He said, why are you troubled? Now, remember, Joseph is surrounded by trouble. Joseph is in prison because he was in trouble. Joseph was betrayed. He was falsely accused. And here he is, and his focus is not on the pain and the wrong that was done to him, but how can I help you? And they say, we have these dreams, and there's no one to interpret. And Joseph says, interpretation belongs to God. Tell me your dreams. And what does that tell us? Joseph has never stopped trusting God. He's been falsely accused. He's been forced out. He's in prison. And yet, he's, his attitude is serving. His effort is in serving. His heart is to hold on to God. He's, and so, if we know the story, we know that Joseph was able to interpret their dreams. The dreams came true. The 
the baker was, was killed, the cupbearer was restored, and Joseph said to the cupbearer, when you're restored to your position, please remember me before Pharaoh and tell him that I'm in prison unjustly. But what happened? The cupbearer did what? He forgot. So now he's forced out. He's falsely accused. He's forgotten. Have you ever been forgotten? Have you ever helped someone tremendously and they just go, you know, they go on into success and they totally forget you and what you did for them? This is what happened to Joseph. And yet Joseph maintains his faith in God. How do we know that? Because two years later, when he gets called before Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, I have these dreams. I've heard you can interpret them. And Joseph's response is, I can't, but God can. I can't, but God can. Joseph still is holding on to his faith. There are times in life where we will be forced out, we will be falsely accused, and we will be forgotten. And when that happens, Satan is going to come to us and say, man, those people were so mean to you. Why don't you just be a little bitter? Why don't you just get angry? Why don't you figure out how you can get revenge? Why don't you stop trying? Why don't you just watch entertainment? Why don't you get into exercise? Why don't you go travel? Why don't you forget about this? God doesn't care about you. He left you here. And if we give in to that, we bind ourselves. But what do we see about the story of Joseph? What we see in the story of Joseph is that God gave a cocky 17-year-old kid a dream about where he was going to end up in life. God spoke to him and gave him a promise. But the problem is the Gucci-wearing Joseph would have been a disaster as the prime minister of Egypt. A disaster. And so God gave him the vision, but then he took him on a journey to develop his character so he would be a man for the purpose that God created him. And the rest of the story is that Joseph saved Egypt. He saved his family through the wisdom of administering Egypt through the, fam through the good years and through the famine. God prepared Joseph for the plan through pain. You know, there's a, a, a pastor who, he put it this way, this needed to happen, or that needed to happen, so this could happen. That needed to happen, so this could happen. As a slave in Potiphar's house, Joseph learned how to manage people, how to delegate responsibility, how to create plans and execute those plans. He learned all these management skills that as the youngest brother who's hated by his brothers, he would have never had the opportunity to learn. His job back home was just to be the reporter. As a slave in Potiphar's house, he learned how to manage. When he was in prison, he learned how to have empathy for those who were hurting. He learned how to care for the downtrodden. He, he learned how to care for those who are unfairly accused, who are treated unfairly. As a prime minister, you want someone who knows how to delegate, someone who knows how to motivate people, someone who knows how to execute plans. You also want someone who cares about those who've been treated unjustly. You see, God took Joseph from his position, walked him through pain so that he could take the position that God had for him. And Joseph did what he could in that situation. He refused to bind himself with bitterness. He put his gloves on. 
He put his apron on and he held on to faith. In your situation where you are right now, have you been forced out? Have you been falsely accused? Have you been forgotten? How are you controlling your response? Are you bound in bitterness and anger and the desire for revenge? Are you free? Do you have the gloves on or are you sitting on the couch waiting for God to change your circumstances? Do you have an apron on ready to serve wherever you're at? This, this is what God calls us to. This is how God wants us to respond. He wants us to trust him through the pain. Because he is working in us. Paul says that these momentary light afflictions are working within us an eternal weight of glory. If you will work with God in the circumstances you're in, the way you're being treated, it will develop in you an eternal weight of glory. Don't wait passively. Put the gloves on and say, in this place, whatever's in front of me, I'm going to get to work. You know, Paul says, whatever you do, do it as for the Lord, not for men. Joseph wasn't working for Potiphar. He's working for God. If you're motivated by your boss, you're going to be disappointed. But if you're motivated and saying, God, I'm going to do my best in this situation with what I have, no matter how I'm treated, this is the heart that honors God that he can promote. If you say, whatever situation is, I'm going to care about what other people are going through. I'm going to look at their faces. And when they're in trouble, I'm going to offer my help, even though I'm being mistreated, even though I was forced out, falsely accused, even though they're going to forget me, I am going to live this way. This is the kind of person that God is showing us he promotes. You can't control the way other people treat you. You can't control your circumstances, but you have absolute control over your attitude over your response and over your holding on to God or not. Nobody can take those away from you. Nothing can take that control away from you. As the worship team comes on up, we're going to close with the song, the chorus still. Come on up, guys. Hide me now under your wings. Shelter me. Whatever you're going through, whatever situation you're in, and maybe you feel like Joseph and you're waiting for God to change the circumstances, you're waiting for God to promote you, or, or maybe you feel like you're stuck in this prison, this job is like a prison, or, or the situation is like a prison. Mm -hmm.